When you're with a pimp, they name you. Each one names you a different name. You can't say, my name is Tina. My name's not Tina. I don't even pick my name. They pick your name for you. They say your name is Sunshine. One of my names was Sunshine. They pick your name. So each one renames you. Very similar to slavery when they named them and made them call themselves a different name. I didn't have a choice. Did I want to eat? Did I want to, have to, did I want to pay my rent? Did I want to be able to get transportation in the city? I'm selling my body for money so I could take a bus. You know, that doesn't sound like a, a choice. She lost her glasses several days into her trafficking situation, and her prescription was quite strong, so she couldn't see who was coming in the room um, to have sex with her. People are judging you, so you can't go to them because they're talking about you. They think this is a choice, so now I have to pretend that this is what I want to do. Now I have to say, I don't care. It's just about the money. I have to make up these things to fit in so you won't think bad about me. So what does that do to someone's mental state? Well, you lose hope. I think when we think about sex trafficking in DC, all our minds go internationally at first or it goes to the posters that we've seen with people with their hands up, with barcodes on the ground, a misinterpretation of what trafficking actually is. Trafficking occurs when youth exchange anything of value for sex. So it could be a cell phone, it could be a ride, it could be a place to sleep, it could be drugs. Under the federal law, um, any minor engaged in a commercial sex act is considered a victim of human trafficking. And so, you know, most often that looks like children being exploited uh, through the system of prostitution, but it's not limited to that. So when you see young people who are being exploited in strip clubs, through pornography, through massage parlors, all of that constitutes sex trafficking, uh, child sex trafficking under the law. So some people may not be aware, but there are four paradigms of sex trafficking. Family control, survival sex, gang control, and pimp control. Families who may sexually exploit children within the family, um, sometimes parents or extended relatives, um, as a means of supporting a family need, um, addiction, may, uh, play a role in that. Familial exploitation, I think, um, works because children rely on their families to have their needs met, and their families are often the most important people in their lives. And so if your family member has expressed to you that, you know, I need you to do this so that we can pay the rent, or I need you to do this um, so that we can buy your sister's medicine, Things like that um, make it really difficult for the child to feel like, A, that they would tell anybody that it's happening, and B, like there's any other option that the family has. A current case that's up right now of a young girl that we have that's 10 years old, and it was definitely her mother. Um, and she was selling her on the street and online on Instagram as well. Did the people know her age? <laughs> well. They knew that she was 10 years old knowingly, and it was the mother who would make the dates for her. So that is definitely family control situation. She was removed from her home, and the mother is being charged. And it is especially difficult, I think, for kids to feel like there's a way out, because if they do report anything to anyone, kids kind of know a bit about um, what might happen if they raise information to an authority or even to a teacher who would likely call an authority. Um, and for that child, the worst case scenario might be being removed from their home. I think the level of betrayal um, in those particular cases that the youth feels is profound um, to be trafficked by a family member. We don't want youth to live in a world where they're already so used to their body being violated perhaps by a loved one or family member or a teacher, um, that it doesn't feel so strange to then actually be in a position where they're using survival sex to get needs met. Because survival sex, um, it, it might sound confusing, but for some youth, they feel more sense of control engaging in survival sex than staying at home and experiencing serial rape by a loved one. 
Um, and sometimes those feel like the options that kids have. Survival sex, which is where they don't have a trafficker necessarily, but they have a buyer who's willing to exploit their vulnerabilities. Um, and, you know, instead of maybe providing them with money, is instead providing them with food or shelter. Survival sex essentially is any sort of a sexual act that people would be able, people would participate in in order to get their needs met. So, for example, I have a client who is now she's 20 um, and she has a child. And at various points during her time in foster care, she hasn't felt comfortable staying where she was supposed to stay. Um, she didn't feel like she had a way to feed herself or her son. So she'd find herself in situations where she might sleep with someone um, to make sure that she and her son had somewhere to stay that night. Your environment is not giving you a stable place to live. Your environment is not giving you food and, and um, clothing. Your environment is lacking. And so while you don't have a trafficker who may hit you with hangers or lock you in a closet, you're having to still survive through the exchange of sex for money. And you know what's worse? Is that the community looks at you with a different lens. If you were considered a, uh, having been trafficked, you were a victim. If you engage in survival sex or been environmentally trafficked, you did it on your own. You wanted that life. And, they, and they, it's so unfortunate that the community does not often see the victimization that individuals who engage in that lifestyle go through every day or went through prior to having to enter that life. The next piece is gang control. So mostly in our area, that's our Latina population who is not over the age of 15. And that can be MS-13 gangs, 18th Street Los Locos. So usually the youth think they're actively in a gang and you may think that they're actively in this gang, but they're actually just being sold and used as a commodity inside the gang. We've been seeing an increase in sexual exploitation in gangs for many years now. Um, historically, gangs have used um, drugs or weapons as a, a means of business and uh, they have discovered that selling children and women is more financially lucrative. You know, where there's one weapon or one drug and that gets sold one time, um, a child or a woman can be sold many times. We had a, a youth that came from Latin America. Her family had um, come to the U.S. without her, left her in Latin America. She was incredibly hurt by that. She had abandonment and trust issues as a result. And when they finally were able to bring her to the United States, she had a language barrier, and she was angry at the only people she knew, which are her, her parents. And so she lashed out, and she sought um, that attention and trust in the community. Unfortunately, who she ran into were MS-13 gang members. And um, they started off as her friends. They recognized she didn't have anybody else to speak to. She didn't sit with anybody at school. She didn't have any friends. She didn't seem to want to go home. And they slowly groomed her into being, oh, you know, I'm. let me be your boyfriend. Let me be your best friend. And before she knew it, she was being gang raped as an initiation procedure for the gang. And she stayed in that because she truly believed the gang was her only family. Um, and then she believed at that point that her family would not accept her anymore because she had been tainted by the gang. So the most form that everyone really knows the most of is pimp control. That pimp and is a trafficker. Trafficker and pimp is one and the same thing. A pimp can be a male or a female who is taking all the money, profiting off of the person, whether they're an adult or a minor. In recent studies, only 12% of victims identified their trafficker as a pimp. The vast majority identified them as a family member, an intimate partner, a romantic interest, um, a father figure. 
So, um, so understanding that statistic goes a long way in understanding how effective the grooming process is in maintaining the victimization and maintaining her silence. In general, when we think of you know like pimps or exploiters, we think people who come on really hard, they beat you into submission, and that's how they get your loyalty out of fear. Love is just as much a motivator as fear is. And so most of my clients, they don't start off being physically or otherwise abused by whoever becomes their exploiter. They've been what you termed as groomed. So they are building a trusting, loving relationship with somebody, usually somebody older, but it can start off with somebody around their age who's already been exploited themselves and who's then bringing them into the life. And so this is their friend, or this is their boyfriend, or girlfriend, or whoever it might be, a mentor, a coach. And it's somebody who's shown them what it feels like to be valued, to be loved, and who's told them, nobody else understands you like I understand you. Nobody else cares about you like I care about you. Grooming is a process that allows a trafficker to start very slowly to build a relationship with a child, and then escalates that relationship and that access and that control so slowly and gradually that the child might not really notice exactly when it became exploitative, exactly when they no longer felt like it was safe to leave, exactly when it stopped feeling good and nice and special and started feeling a bit scary or a bit like they didn't have another option. Um, and so traffickers will often invest um, weeks or months into building relationships with youth, weeks or months into building a sense in that child that this person loves me and understands me better than I feel like anyone ever has. And part of that is because the trafficker is not necessarily saying what's true, right? They're saying whatever it is they think that specific child needs to hear to start depending on them and trusting them and feeling safe with them. And then they're looking for ways to control. Example I can use is a young lady. She was walking to her middle school um, and for a few months there was a guy who followed her to and from school. She was targeted first. So the person following her knew already that she walked to school alone. He knew who she lived with already. She was living with her grandparent, um, which made her a lot more vulnerable than other children who walked to school with other kids or had a bigger support system at home. Throughout the time that she would walk to school, he would offer her things like gifts, he would offer her a ride to school, anything to make her life easier from the time she left home to the time she arrived to school. Um, after about four, five, six months of this happening, um, she decided to, to speak up about what was happening. She didn't necessarily think she was in danger. However, she didn't necessarily understand how that was the first part of being groomed. In a lot of the cases, it was someone they had met either online or briefly in person, um, but then continued the relationship online. Um, so someone who, uh, usually young men, um, were contacting uh, our clients on various social networking websites um, and building trust with them to the point where uh, they saw them as a, as a support and as someone to go to in a time of hardship. Um, just long enough that they could then exploit that trust um, when, the, when the opportunity arose. It's actually super easy to manipulate children. We do it every day to manipulate kids. We tell them to clean their room and we give them a lollipop or a dollar. We manipulate them. And it's easy because youth don't think they're being manipulated. They don't think, they, they know everything. Have you ever talked to a teenager? You know everything. And, and that is what traffickers prey on. Um, I think the role in children being vulnerable to be manipulated by traffickers and others is, you know, really trying to identify what gaps, what vulnerability those children may have in terms of their needs being met, whether it be food, shelter, clothing, uh, companionship. And traffickers are very sophisticated in identifying children who um, are exposed and therefore it makes it easier for them to feel like they have found someone who is going to listen to them, who's going to provide for them, who's going to support them, and makes it so that it feels authentic. And by the time they have bought into that uh, gap being filled, um, they've made themselves even more vulnerable to being harmed and being trafficked. I think it is important to consider language when we're talking to a young person who we have concerns about. Um, they're likely not going to be thinking that 
they've been sexually exploited or trafficked, so we shouldn't use those words for them. Um, rather, they're going to be thinking they're in a romantic relationship with somebody who cares about them. And because uh, there may be a trauma bond at play, uh, they may even rationalize or deny uh, that abuse is happening or that there's anything wrong at all. Yes, this person is their friend, quote unquote. Um, but the young person doesn't really acknowledge that their relationship is harmful because initially in the beginning, yes, they are, they were their friend. Um, and some of them, they, they might have been their boyfriend or their girlfriend. So um, that bond is created between the trafficker and the traffic. Um, so if we do get them to help, sometimes what we see is that they may go back to the trafficker based off of that relationship. Some of the things that are unique to trafficking um, that reinforces the trauma bond is oftentimes the youth feels a lot of shame about um, what they are doing or what they have been forced to do. And they also feel at times like it's a unique subculture other people wouldn't necessarily understand, which further isolates the youth and strengthens the bond with the trafficker as well. So it's important to note that traffickers will exploit children who are vulnerable and who do not have a protective factor. Traffickers will seek out children who have fallen through the cracks and will groom them for sexual exploitation. I mean, I think the thing that is the most surprising is that it's not surprising. You meet these girls and, or, or boys, and after you hear where they've come from, I'm more surprised when my clients are not being exploited in some way. One of the most heartbreaking things that I see is that youth that I've done a sexual abuse evaluation on when they were in elementary school, I then saw again when they were 12 and 13, and we did a sexual assault evaluation on them. And now they know me. Um, because they've seen me previously, but they're in my exam room again now because they're being trafficked. You know, I think people tend to think of human trafficking as only the vulnerable populations who fall into circumstances where they're taken advantage of by predators. But as we see with the expansive use of technology, there are more and more potential victims to be targeted, and that can take place through a host of technological avenues or social media apps. And we do see situations where predators will use what are innocent social media apps or technology for their own uh, ill intent to lure children or young adults into human trafficking. Um, a lot of the clients that I worked with when they were being trafficked, it was uh, they were they were being trafficked online mostly. They were doing less of the like street trafficking. Uh, but the people who were buying, as far as I know, um, I mean, the feeling I got was that they were mostly middle-aged men. The being sold is not what people expect. The individuals that are being sold, it's um, the vast majority are American citizens, and the vast majority are from um, communities of color. On a national level, 70% of the people who are trafficked are African Americans. And I think that's important because the posters you see and the people you see on the news don't look like the statistic and the reality of what I have to see every day. I know there are male survivors of trafficking. I've seen a couple. I know there are more out there. I just don't think they're being identified. Racism is a big factor, and we certainly see in D.C. that um, children of color are more vulnerable and are being exploited more regularly. Uh, well, I think, you know, for us, we talk about the sex trade in terms of the legacy of sexual exploitation in this country. Um, prostitution and sex trafficking are directly related to systems of oppression that have long existed in this country. So we can directly trace them back to things like colonization, where Native American women and girls were commodified and exploited for the benefit of white settlers. Um, you can also trace this all the way back to the African-American slave trade, where black and brown women's bodies were rendered property uh, for male profit and pleasure. And so the normalization of this sexual exploitation over centuries has come to impact sex trafficking today. 
So we can't talk about the Black commodification of Black women and girls' bodies without historically talking about how Black women and girls have, how their bodies have been used to build white wealth in this country. Historically and culturally, we saw during slavery, there were a couple of specific terms that were used, the Jezebel and the Sapphire, and those images were defined as the over-sexual exploitation of Black women's bodies. We see how they continue to be used in today's society. We see it in music videos. We see it in TV shows and movies. Um, we see it in magazines. Um, so it's a myriad of ways that that shows up. When you look at that imagery in today's culture, what that also tells us is that we're still continuing to see this paradigm that we saw during slavery times where black women and girls' bodies are continuing to be, are continuing to be used to build wealth in this country, specifically for white men, as well as their bodies are being used for the sexual gratification of men. Men are paying to rape black and brown girls. And that does not mean that boys are not being um, sex trafficked as well. Um, boys and gender non-conforming um, youth are also being um, bought and sold for sex. And um, it's a big problem here in D.C. We found that our clients were at the intersection of multiple risk factors, including uh, institutional racism, intergenerational poverty, housing and food insecurity. Um, and as young as 13, um, and up until, you know, 21. All children in foster care are more vulnerable than other children because in general, you have kids who have an army of people who are responsible for various parts of their lives as opposed to a child who might grow up within a two-parent household or even a one-parent household, but there's one person or two people who are responsible for knowing, you know, who their friends are, where they spend their time, um, what activities they're supposed to be involved in who are noticing day-to-day -day changes in behavior, my clients don't have the benefit of that. So they might change foster homes several times in a year. Homelessness is a big one. Um, there are you know, many youth who end up out on the street for different reasons. There could be uh, abuse in their home or other safety concerns that lead them to uh, leave the home. We know that children who are homeless are at um, a huge risk to be exploited. Um, and we also know that in the district, um, homeless youth are disproportionately LGBTQ youth who may have been displaced from their families or their communities because they've been rejected or they feel like they'll be rejected or they're trying to find ways to explore their identities that aren't allowed or permissed at home. Um, so homophobia is a big part of it as well. What's interesting is when you look at the demographics of the buyers, they tend to uh, have a very different demographics. So from the work that we've done, again, in D.C. and throughout the country, we've come to see that the gender and racial disparities among sex buyers tend to be uh, white, middle-aged men with means. And so when you look at that and you compare that to the fact that the vast majority of child sex trafficking victims are in fact young women and girls of color, uh, in DC predominantly African-American and Afro-Latina young girls and uh, gender non-conforming and trans youth, uh, it paints a, a really startling picture of the power and control dynamics that are at play when we look at sex trafficking and the power and privilege that sex buyers pr possess. Well, they may have been rich, but they weren't all rich. They may have been nice, as they thought they were nice, but they weren't really nice. They didn't care about me. They didn't care about my well-being. They didn't care that I was hurting inside. They didn't care that every day after I left them, I went and drank a lot of whiskey and smoked crack as a way to leave my body because of the trauma I was putting myself through. They didn't care if they were the first, second, or third John of the evening and what I was going through as a result of having to spend an an hour and a half with them. The good that you used to think that was probably out there turns into it's probably not out there because all you see is evil. People who you would never think in your life bought sex, it's definitely buying sex and doing some crazy stuff, right? Or you find out that the person who buys you on a regular basis is a judge. What we know from our local service providers who help and provide services for youth who've been sex trafficked is that boys are having their first time being bought and sold for sex at between the ages of 11 and 13. 
and girls are experiencing that for the first time between the ages of 12 and 14. I didn't know that I was a victim of trafficking, you know, even though I was 13, you know, when I started, I thought that it was my choice. Now, is it possible for someone to not be aware of how old someone is? Sure. But if you are buying sex, then it's your responsibility to know how old someone is. And it's your responsibility to take accountability for the fact that you've raped a child, if that's what you've done. Um, it's not you know, the child's responsibility. It's not anyone else's responsibility to make sure that that person is of age and can consent. Let's be very clear. Children cannot consent to sex work. There is no such thing as child prostitution. And the bottom line is, it's rape. So you have these predominantly Caucasian men from Virginia Tech, and sometimes Maryland as well, coming into certain populations and area to buy people. We don't pay attention to that. that. That always amazes me, that we can only pay attention to person in the light, but not all these tags and different people coming in and out. And that's what actually fuels this. It's normally not even the people in the community buying sex in that previous community. It's the other people coming from other communities, knowing about that community, bringing it in. Also, the most important part about that is the areas because also the buyers know that they're, no one's calling police on them. They're not gonna get in trouble. I think the people who are buying the sex, I, I think we need to look more at that. I could surmise that, you know, we have issues as a society respecting women and children. Our society children are overly sexualized. There's sort of a glorification of um, sex and pimp culture and in the media. Um, in music, video, men in particular who are doing a large part of the buying of the children uh, need to be holding each other accountable uh, for respecting women and children and treating them with equality and, uh, and that respect. There's a lot of reasons why we see this continued demand for sex uh, and illegal sex, right? So I think um, where we're seeing a growing demand for sex with underage girls, I think is absolutely connected to trends that we're seeing in pornography. Um, right now, one of the most um, searched terms in pornography is teen. Uh, I think even when you just look at the titles, uh, you'll see that a lot of it is really uh, fetishizing sex with underage girls, stepdaughters, teen girls, cheerleaders, you know, high school girls. And I think understanding that these are children and when we are promoting and normalizing sex with underage girls, it creates more of a demand with underage girls. The majority of its creation and consumption um, is demonstrating a type of sexuality that is inauthentic to who we are as human beings. It is a performance. It never speaks about intimacy. It never speaks about love, caring, gentleness, and all of the other aspects of a healthy sexual relationship. It doesn't create a space for consent. It doesn't cre create a space for an evolution in our sexuality. It literally, again, is the opposite of what we'd want to be teaching any young person about sex. We live in a world where um, objectification of women and girls is common. Objectification of anyone for sex is common. Um, and that, you know, applies to children as well. I think um, the racism and sexism intersect in that way in that black and brown children are often sexualized at earlier ages. So whether it's, you know, shows like The Kardashians or, you know, Toddlers and Tiaras or going to Victoria's Secret and seeing them market push-up bras or thongs for tweens, all of these types of conditions are really normalizing uh, the objectification of children uh, and young girls. And I think that our failure to recognize that and to call that out is really fueling this demand in, in so many ways. I remember when girls my age were on TV looking like girls my age. And now with increasing frequency, you know, we're seeing sexualized images of 12 year olds. So of course my clients and, and other girls that age are going to try to you know, resemble that, that idea of what they should be and that, that ideal of perfection and how people are making money on Instagram for posting, you know, inappropriate or, or extremely provocative photos even though they're underage. But men are gobbling that up. You know, they are they're eating it up and they are asking for more and more and more. Supply and demand. 
And so that's the issue. The issue is there unfortunately is a demand of children because we get about seven to eight referrals per week. From what we know about various legal approaches to the sex industry is that there's three primary approaches. There's legalization, decriminalization, and partial decriminalization. I think everyone can agree that human trafficking should not be decriminalized. I think most people would agree on the selling of sex. It's everything else in between where there are issues. The problem is historically what demand strategies look like are prostitution enforcement. So going out and arresting um, prostitutes on the street, which we know can and are often victims. We're setting up the same dynamic in our criminal justice system that the pimps use with the, the victims. We are telling them, yes, we will offer you services, but only if you do X. You can come and get a bed to sleep in, but only if you promise never to go back, which is probably not gonna happen the first time. It might take a few times before a victim is willing to leave that life. That's all that they've known for a period of time. And due to the trauma bonding that occurs between a victim and a trafficker, they're just not ready. And so when we set up all of these roles, we're setting them up for fail failure. But for me, what I find most offensive is these pro prosecutors using the criminal charges that are usually a result of a sting operation because the police always go after the victims instead of the Johns. And oh, I say always, but it's the majority of what we see. And as a result, then they say, okay, well, now that we have you with this criminal charge, we won't let that criminal charge go until you give us what we need, which is the information to prosecute this trafficker. And sometimes if that information isn't good enough, well, then we're still gonna keep those criminal charges. So we're re-victimizing these survivors. Partial decriminalization model has been um, adopted in a number of countries. It's actually um, gaining a lot of momentum internationally. Uh, it was first started in Sweden in 1999. Uh, since then, not a single woman in prostitution has been murdered in Sweden uh, from a sex buyer, as opposed to places like Germany, where there's been tens upon tens of deaths every year in brothels. Um, and so what we know about that approach is that it's actually made Sweden and countries that have adopted this model less attractive to organized crime, less attractive to traffickers. Uh, buyers are not as willing to engage in solicitation because they know they can be held accountable. Um, but in those countries, what they've done is decriminalize the sale and then keep all of the other legal prohibitions in place against purchasing, you know, pandering, pimping, uh, brothel keeping. Some of the things our youth talk about that means a lot to them is not decriminalizing um, prostitution. Yes, they shouldn't go to jail, but not letting buyers off. One of the questions I ask my middle schoolers is, raise your hand if you are friends with someone older than you, 10 years older than you. People raise their hand 20 years older than you. People raise their hand 30 years older than you. People raise their hand. So, okay, you're friends with them online. Why are you friends with them? So I think it's important for concerned parents, concerned adults, concerned peers to consider three major factors that could impact a child in terms of exploitation or uh, human trafficking. Uh, they involve uh, their behavior, uh, technology, and the individuals that are surrounding them. Warning signs that we see a lot are um, missing school all of a sudden, uh, older boyfriends. If you see them having a lot more material things that they typically don't have, the first semester you might see a girl or a boy or anyone may come in with one style of clothing, one style of shoe or jewelry, and then by the last semester, they may have all these name brands and, you know, more jewelry, more shoes, different outfit every day or different shoes every day. Where do they get that from? Are not at home when they should be. Um, they may be out and about with the person who is exploiting them. And uh, we often see tattoos, um, and so, I know that young people like to get tattoos these days. I think it's important to ask them about the tattoo. Can they explain why they got it, how they got it? Uh, that's really important. Uh, gangs use branding tattoos. Pimps use branding tattoos. And so if the young person can't explain it, that would be a concern as well. So if a child were suddenly to revert back to infantile behavior, such as thumb sucking, 
uh, excessive crying, that should raise a, flit, a red flag for the parent or a teacher or, or another friend who becomes aware of it. Any unexplained bruising or signs of just uh, physical abuse could be another sign or symptom. Running away or missing uh, youth is typically a concern, uh, especially if when they come back, they can't tell you where they've been or they allude to the fact that they couldn't leave where they were. Owing somebody money is also a sign or a, a concern that someone may be involved. These are our basis, a template of what signs may look like, but they can be different things. More importantly, what I always tell everybody is, please take their phone to look at it. Don't take their phone though, because as a parent, you can do amazing things. You can track the phone, you can set up email alerts, you can see all their Instagram posts if you wanna. There are so many things that we can do. I say do that. That's very important because 100% of all of our youth have met people online. We have to listen to children, right? That's not just allowing them to be babysat by technology, whether it be a video game, or social media, or online. We have to really be willing to listen to what's going on, how they're interacting with it, ask questions about their experiences so that we can offer some intergenerational guidance and support um, so that technology and the traffickers are not the only ones trying to engage our young people uh, with the use of technology. So anything that a parent would have limited knowledge to is a point of concern for us. Uh, any type of social media app or technology that they're unfamiliar with. So we encourage parents to familiarize themselves with any type of technology or social media use that their children are engaging in that they are not familiar with. So I know there's some techno technology where videos can be sent and then deleted. You know, that's something that a parent should be very uh, diligently monitoring to make sure that their children are not sharing information, their personal private information. The first thing I always say is starts at home. Educating the parents means that we have a greater chance of educating the youth. Um, having a healthier home, communicating, um, addressing generational trauma within the home and uh, within our communities. I think the most important thing is to listen to them. Uh, it's not that difficult to figure out who is part of the most marginalized group. As policymakers, as people, as voters, as people who support policymakers and legislators, I think we really need to push forward to identify people and policies that are going to show our young people that they have value and that they have potential and that they are worth the investment that we can make in them as a community. My clients are all women, are all girls actually, but it happens to boys too. And I think that we're setting up generations of, of hurt people who might hurt people down the line. Anybody who can vote in D.C. can do is to really reach out to their council members and um, explain to them that they think that this is a really important issue and want to see D.C. make some concrete and long-standing investments into providing services that both prevent um, child sex trafficking and also uh, work to help heal children from the trauma of being commercially and sexually exploited. Coming together as a society and making clear that this isn't socially acceptable, that this is another form of gender-based violence, is really critical um, to combating this issue long term. I think that's one of the issues around sexual exploitation that uh, has been very frustrating, is that we know survivors experience much of the same forms of trauma that other survivors of sexual violence experience, but we fail to see sex trafficking, prostitution, sexual exploitation as forms of violence against women and girls. So we're really clear that it's men who are perpetrating these crimes, who's perpetrating this violence. But more importantly than that, it's going to be men who are the solutions to resolving it and preventing it in all forms uh, in our community. And so for us, we want to always lift up what we think men can do, what men, uh, the best of who we are as men, and that we're on this together. If we're really going to uh, role model for our boys and our girls and our community uh, what healthy masculinity is about, uh, men have to be involved in our daily lives. And we have to see this as central to our own identity as men. Um, so we just want to invite all of, our, all of the men in our community um, to live up and step up to be their best selves and, and demonstrate that we're not going to accept child sex trafficking in Washington, D.C. Uh, I think, you know, one of the prevention techniques that we promote as, as a form of violence prevention is curbing the demand. 
for sex um, and, and paid sex because I think, especially now as we are grappling with, you know, issues of gender equality, of male privilege and male entitlement, um, this is something that we really have to look at. I know there's been a lot of work and, and, and on the part of our colleagues to really promote what's known as healthy masculinity and really combat um, toxic forms of masculinity. And I think this fits right into that, you know, understanding that it's not enough not to, you know, uh, beat and rape women, but understanding the ways in which you are complicit in the exploitation and denigration of women and girls by purchasing sex, by engaging in sexual exploitation, that this isn't harmless behavior. And I think that by doing education around that, and taking steps to curb the demand, particularly the demand fueled by um, who are known as high frequency buyers. Because I think that's another important thing to realize. The vast majority of men aren't contributing to this, but the handful that are, are fueling the market. And they are being very successful at arguing that this is you know, normal, boys will be boys behavior, and that it ought to be socially acceptable. So for the community, a few things. Let's not make assumptions. When we see people standing outside on the street, it actually amazes me how many times they're like, oh, I see them. I know they're in 14th and K. Did you see the guy next to him? And they're like, oh yeah, that's right. And we don't pay attention to the long line of men that's lying down the street. So if you're paying attention to the girl, I need you to look around her and see who she keeps staring back at, where she's looking, follow her gaze and see, and then pay attention to all the cars lined up because she didn't stand outside probably longer than two minutes. Take their tag numbers. We're calling them into the police, right? When you decriminalize purchasing sex, is you're basically signaling to society that this is socially acceptable behavior, it's not worthy of enforcement. And so what happens is now you have more men entering the market, not just from DC or the DMV area, but throughout the country uh, and even internationally. It's similar to the sex tourism that we see in Nevada. It's similar to how people go to Amsterdam to access the red light district. And so what you would be doing is inviting more men into the market here in DC. And the reality of the sex industry is that you're never gonna have as many willing participants as an unchecked, unfettered demand requires. And so traffickers will always seek to meet that demand. We have a 24 hour operational command information center. The telephone number is 202-727-9099. And any citizen can call in and speak to one of our officers or supervisor and provide uh, key information if they become aware of any type of human trafficking, any type of behavior that they see in their neighborhood that they think could be crime related, uh, specifically with children. Uh, if they come across any technological um, use where children are exploited, such as something on the internet, or if a, a shared computer at a school or a library, for example, if they become aware of something on there, they can call that number and we can have the proper investigative unit, in this case, Internet Crimes Against Children Unit, go and handle that uh, investigation and find out as much as possible about the digital evidence or the information that was provided. There's also a way to text tips to our command information center. The text number is 50411. So one helpful way to remember that is to text the 50, the 411, get us the information and we will follow up on that tip and make sure that the proper investigative unit is handling the tip. As a regular person that's not connected to any type of human trafficking education and you see something that you may be suspicious of or that just doesn't look right, say something. Call the National Human Trafficking Hotline and report it or reach out to somebody that you think that may be able to do something about it, whether it's a community leader or another social service provider that has the tools to address the situation. I think DC's response to trafficking is way ahead of most jurisdictions that I have either worked with or heard about. Um, there's really a coordinated approach in the district um, with all of the different agencies involved with these youth. Our motto is we are here to help and that's something that we want all parents, all adults, uh, teachers, mentors to, to know and to feel when they encounter us and when they leave. We want them, if there's behavior that they see as alarming and they notify us, even if it turns out to be nothing, we want them to know that 
hey, we are here to help. We think of it just like seatbelt law. Uh, people would not get into a car now and not buckle the seatbelt. It has not always been that way. And so for us, we believe it's the same kind of social norm that we're trying to apply to people who purchase children for sex. We want to make it so that no one in our community believes that it is acceptable, appropriate, or the right thing to do to purchase a child for sex, the same way no one would get in a car nowadays and not buckle their seatbelt. I think compassion goes a long way and it's undervalued. We don't recognize that human to human element. What a smile can do, what a hello can do, that makes someone feel like they're human again. I'm not asking that people in the community invite uh, individuals off the street into their home for a shower, but they can be aware of what local organizations are nearby. Where can they go get a shower? Where can they go get something to eat? What do they need? And if nothing else, ask them what they need. Go make a phone call, 311. Where can I send someone to get a shower? People have a rescue fantasy. Um, with youth who've been trafficked, that um, you're going to identify them, you're going to rescue them, and their life is going to be better. I think it's really important to meet youth where they are um, and to understand that they may not think or recognize that they're being trafficked right now. And my job is just to make sure that you're safe and healthy. My job is to minimize any risks to your health and safety right now. And so I'm going to address all of that and also recognize your autonomy. I think most people want to know, how long does it take to get a good place? It took me 10 years to get out of the life. So I don't think that we should expect a person who's nine or 10 to be done completely out the life when they get services at 15 for six months. This is a long-term process to change a whole entire mindset. So rescuing a person isn't really a rescue if you rescue a body and not the mind.